Let's start chapter 24, the digestive system, thinking about the big picture. You are, I am, a heterotroph. Now, if we break this word apart, hetero meaning other, troph, we're thinking um, like nutrients. Um, if you've taken like an ecology class, you'll talk about different trophic levels, different eating levels, are you a producer, a consumer, herbivore, carnivore, that kind of stuff, right? So as a heterotroph, you must consume other organism in order to get your nutrients, right? You're not an autotroph, you're not a, a plant producer. You can't make your own, uh, you can't capture energy from sunlight. You have to eat another organism. Okay, we've got that. Now think about why we need to eat that other organism. What are we trying to gain? There's really two main things that we need. Right? One of those is energy. So part of us eating is to run that food through these catabolic processes, even at the cellular level, right? Doing catabolism or catabolic reactions, right? Breaking molecules down because catabolic reactions are also exergonic. They release energy. Right, so catabolic reactions go from something more complex to something more simple. Right? An exergonic reaction means that it releases energy. Right? So that's one of the reasons that we eat, is to have enough energy that we can take notes, that we can go play basketball, go skiing, whatever. Right? The other thing we need are building blocks for the things our body wants to make. So for example, if you ate a cheeseburger, right, you would run through a bunch of different catabolic reactions. You would take a nice long protein, right, a string of amino acids, right, and you would break that into individual amino acids. These are going to be the building blocks that your cells need in order to do things like build their own proteins. Right? So to go from these amino acids to that protein, whether that's an antibody, whether that's hemoglobin, whether that's albumin, right? you need to have consumed food to have the building blocks. This kind of reaction is an example of an anabolic, a building, reaction, right? And these reactions, just since we're on the same page here, um, are what are considered endergonic. They require energy. So these things go together. You're consuming food to have energy to do things and also to have energy to build things. You're consuming food so that you have the building blocks to build those as well, right? So we build proteins, we build lipids, right? We can take individual fatty acids, and do an anabolic reaction to make a triglyceride, a more complicated form, a way that we like to store energy. Um, we can actually take individual glucose molecules. Sorry, that's a terrible drawing, right? We can put them together into complicated chains to store for later. What would we call that? Glycogen, good. And that, of course, all those building blocks are coming from our food. Okay, so as we start to jump in here, this is actually a pretty long chapter, right? There's a lot of different components, right? Different structures involved here in the digestive system, and they have lots of different functions that they're going to fulfill. Now, notice here they've, they've split the digestive tract up really into the tract itself, please do note this spelling. I know a lot of times it sounds like digestive track, like you're running in circles. Tract, OK? 
okay? Um, so we have the actual tract itself, which truly is just an opening to the outside world at your mouth. It travels through a series of tubes and exits another hole to the outside world at the anus, right? And so we have things like the oral cavity, the pharynx, remember we shared that with the respiratory tract, okay? Uh, the esophagus, stomach, small intestine, and large intestine, right? That is this tube that the food is going to travel through. But then we also have what are considered these accessory organs, organs that really are gonna be dumping products into this tube to help the digestive process. So for example, right, it'd be really hard to do any of this without saliva, right? So the salivary glands, um, they're producing saliva, this fluid, um, it also contains some enzymes, they're gonna start the chemical digestion of foods, right? And that's the simplest example. We'll also talk about the liver, the gallbladder, and the pancreas, and that's part of why this chapter gets so long. Those organs have some really big um, functions that we'll go through here in the digestive system. But um, notice this figure 24-1, right, as they're talking through the different anatomical structures, they're also pointing out their role, right, what their function is. But let's think about this big picture. So function of the digestive tract. And there's quite a few. So the first thing that you need to do, is that spelled right? That's a, that should be a G. So that did not look right. Ingestion. So the first thing you have to do is actually put food into your mouth, right? This is an active process. It requires choice. As an omnivore, an organism that can eat all sorts of different things, plant, animal, we have lots of choices to make. In fact, if you've read any Michael Pollan, he uh, has a book called The Omnivore's Dilemma, and he makes the argument that all these choices actually are part of why our brains are so developed and so large. Anyway, you have to make choices and this is an active process of getting that food in your mouth. Arguably, you could say, hey, the nervous system is taking care of a lot of that. We also okay, do mechanical digestion, and this is gonna occur in lots of these different locations. This is all the, the tearing, chewing, mashing, grinding that takes place along um, this tube. Tearing, right, I'm picturing teeth tearing and mashing. By the time you're in the stomach, maybe there's lots of mixing, churning, right? And this is important in the breakdown of that food to get to the point where it's small enough to absorb. We also require a lot of chemical digestion to make that happen. And with the chemical digestion, we're talking about using things like acids and enzymes. <clears throat> Uh, to break down these foods to smaller components. Like we were talking about before, this is what's going to allow us to take proteins to that smallest form, the amino acid, the monomer that makes up proteins. This is what lets us take carbohydrates, whether a disaccharide like sugar or a polysaccharide like starch, this is what lets us break it into the form of a simple sugar like glucose that can get absorbed, right? And it allows us to take fats like triglycerides and break it into fatty acids, right? This, these are all of those um, raw materials that we need to then build exciting things in our body. Right? And so we use chemical digestion to do that. Okay? So ingestion, mechanical digestion, chemical digestion. Now, to do chemical digestion, right, we actually need lots of different um, acids, enzymes, 
um, buffers, water, all these things to actually be dumped into the digestive tract. And so that is one of our functions as well. I'm out of room, I'm gonna erase, and we'll start up here again, um, with secretion. So this would be number four if you're numbering, right? Secretion. The digestive tract does a ton of this. Um, water gets added to the digestive tract. Enzymes, acids. If you're gonna add acids, you can't let the pH get too crazy. We're gonna make buffers. There's places where we're adding salts. Okay. And so we'll look for a lot of that to come from accessory organs, but sometimes it's coming from the actual organ that's part of this tract as well. Now, when we use these secretions, when we complete that chemical digestion, now we're ready for the function of the di di digestive tract that is its main goal, and that is absorption. Right? So we want to absorb those amino acids, that glucose, those fatty acids, so that we can deliver them to cells throughout the body. So at this point, those tiny molecules, molecules cross epithelium into the actual interstitial fluid And that is absorption. Now, we don't want these nutrients just kind of like hanging around on the periphery. Those are very quickly going to get picked up either by capillaries, right, into the plasma, or our fats actually can't just dissolve into plasma, and so they're picked up by um, those lacteals, those lymphatic capillaries, right? So absorption, I'm gonna put a star here, right? Because that really is the goal. All of this other stuff is just, you know, helping us get there. And then of course, at the very end, um, the, we will use defecation to get rid of any wastes. Um, this, of course, is in the form of feces. And realize these wastes, right, we're talking solid waste, but actually, um, when you look at feces, a, a huge part of that is actually bacteria that were part of this um, digestive process as well, um, passing out of the body, right? But defecation, that also doesn't look. Defecation? Struggling. It's a Monday. Okay. The majority of the digestive system organs are housed in the abdominopelvic cavity. So here's a nice um, kind of sideways look, um, right? You can see this mid-sagittal plane here, um, and we're looking at the abdominopelvic cavity. And one thing that you really should um, realize is that everything, all of these organs are supported and protected um, by what's called the peritoneum. Now, the peritoneum, this is a, a serous membrane. Just very similar to the pericardium or those pleural membranes, the peritoneum is a double-layered serous membrane. And here we see, lining the abdominal cavity wall, we have the parietal peritoneum. And so that's out along the wall. All the organs then are covered in the visceral peritoneum. And these two layers of serous membrane are producing the serous fluid up to, it's around seven liters a day um, that are being produced and then reabsorbed in this abdominal cavity. Again, just like around the other organs, really to decrease friction. Now, what we'll find in quite a few places is we have a joining of where the parietal peritoneum and the serous peritoneum come together, and where those layers are fused, we call it a mesentery.
So there's a few different mesenteries that you should know. Let's see if I have a better marker here. Okay. Um, so the falciform ligament. is a mesentery, right, so serous um, and parietal peritoneum together. And here we see the liver kind of being suspended from the diaphragm, right, by the falciform ligament. Um, between the liver and the stomach, we have a mesentery called the lesser omentum. Right, again, liver to stomach. Off of the stomach, we have this huge fold of a mesentery called the greater omentum. When you opened up your cat, if you saw this just big sheet of adipose underneath uh, the skin there, that is the greater omentum. Um, other omentums, here we have what's called the transverse mesocolon. We see that kind of supporting the large intestine um, off of the body wall. Okay. And the mesentery proper. Mesentery proper is supporting all of the small intestines, again, just kind of anchoring it. Um, if you lift up the small intestine in your cat, it'll be this big uh, kind of web reaching out to the small intestine, um, and that is mesentery proper. Now here's the thing, so if you think about these mesenteries, these connective tissue sheets are carrying things like blood vessels, nerves, lymphatics out to um, all of these organs, right? They're suspending, they're supporting the organs. So carry blood vessels, lymph, lymphatics, nerves, right? And they also support and suspend, not to mention that they're producing these serous fluids and decreasing friction, right? Um, so these mesenteries actually are quite important. There's a couple organs um, in the digestive tract here. We see the pancreas, a section of small intestine that are behind. See how that parietal peritoneum is here? We refer to some of those organs um, as retroperitoneal, right? They're posterior. Uh, the kidneys, different system, but the kidneys would count as retroperitoneal as well. And so in some ways that peritoneum also kind of works to to separate things out, um, right? So if your appendix burst, bacteria would flow into this cavity, the peritoneums, uh, sorry, the mesen, yeah, peritoneum mesentery would try to kind of compartmentalize that and certainly things that are retroperitoneal um, would be safe from that kind of infection. The last part of digestive anatomy that we need to talk about before moving on to physiology comes from figure 24-3. And this is basically looking at the histology of the digestive tract. So we have four main layers that we need to look at here. The first one is called the mucosa, that's the innermost layer. Moving out slightly, we get the submucosa. Third is the muscularis externa, and fourth, is the serosa, also called the visceral peritoneum. So if we look at the mucosa, right, this is the mucous membrane. This is the epithelium and its underlying aerial or connective tissue. Just like we saw in the respiratory tract, you'll also see this referred to as the lamina propria. Okay. And again, this mucosa layer, this is the one that is in contact with the food. It's touching the lumen, the opening, the inside of our entire digestive tract. Now the type of epithelium, just like in the respiratory system, is going to vary. 
So in places like the oral cavity, the pharynx, and the esophagus, where we need protection from tortilla chips, we're going to see a stratified squamous epithelium. So stratified squamous epithelium in places like oral cavity, pharynx, and the esophagus. But then as we move on into the stomach, the small intestine, the large intestine, food is broken down more, and now we're more interested in absorption, right, or secretion. And so we're using a simple columnar epithelium. Again, in places like the stomach, small intestine, and large intestine. All right. So this is simpler, that's, that's what you get, stratified squamous or simple columnar. Now, in these locations, right, as we look at that epithelial layer, I wish I had a closer picture, you'll also see intermixed with these epithelial cells, um, lots of goblet cells there, or uh, mucus cells, um, so goblet cells are producing mucus. Um, we see that kind of throughout, so goblet slash mucus. And we're also intermixed with what are called enteroendocrine. Right? Enteroendocrine. Um, so these are going to be, the, sorry, the name should, should help, endocrine. These are cells that are going to be producing the, the hormones that actually help regulate uh, the digestive System. So there's quite a few, we'll talk about just a couple of them. Um, don't want to get too crazy there. Um, but this is what we're looking at on that mucosa. So again, if you look at this image, that light pink outermost layer, that's trying to show you the epithelium. And this areolar or connective tissue is in yellow, right? So we talked about the epithelium, but what about our areolar or connective tissue? If you look at the picture, Again, we're still in that mucosa layer. If you look at the picture in the yellow, you'll notice a few things. What's in that connective tissue? Well, I see little red lines, little blue lines, there's some green, there's some glands, and that's exactly what you have, right? We're carrying blood vessels. We also have some lymphatics, right? And we also see some glands tucked in there. So that, that lamina propria, that areolar connective tissue, um, is also an important layer. Uh, that's the other one. There is, does it show in the picture? There is a little bit of smooth muscle. Yes, uh, they call it the muscularis mucosa, right? So this pink line in here technically still part of this mucosa layer. A little bit of smooth muscle. Now that's not going to be near as important as this muscularis externa. That's the part that's actually doing peristalsis, right? So this is what we have in that innermost mucosal layer. Let's move on to the submucosa. So the submucosa is shown here kind of in this purple. This submucosa um, is mostly connective tissue, right? This is a dense, irregular connective tissue. And so if you remember that from AMP1, right, you're looking at a lot of collagen, maybe uneven um, 
not aligned in parallel, right? Those collagen fibers go in lots of different directions, and that makes sense. These digestive organs are kind of turning and moving in lots of different ways, right? And what we're gonna find here, right, this really is the layer that's binding the mucosa to things like the muscularis externa. So think of this connective tissue really as binding. Or the, the purpose of this layer is binding the mucosa to the deeper structure, or to the more superficial structures. And again, look at all the things that are embedded here. Blood vessels, lymphatics, um, the yellow lines here are trying to show you nerves, right? We have so many nerves, they call it the submucosal plexus. Blood vessels, lymphatics, submucosal plexus, which are the nerves. You see some glands, right? This is a, a, an exocrine gland. We actually see this duct going out uh, to the surface. So when we say its function is holding two layers together, and then we talk about all those other structures, right, it's clearly doing more than just gluing two layers together. It's carrying a lot of other, or housing a lot of other important structures. All right, muscularis externa is next. And it tells you exactly what it is, right? This is smooth muscle. They call it externa to differentiate it from that muscularis mucosa, right? But this is really this muscularis layer, right? Um, do note that those muscles run in different directions. So this inner layer of smooth muscle. Sorry, so again, this is smooth muscle. not skeletal or cardiac, right? The inner layer is circular. And what they mean by that is the direction that those smooth muscle cells go. They're all kind of wrapping around the whatever organ you're in. And then this outer layer, those cells now are longitudinal, running the length. can try to draw this. Let's see how I would draw this. So, goodness, they've done a better job. So if I'm looking down, say the small intestine, I'm looking down at that inner layer, the cells are wrapping around the intestine. Wow, I really can't do this. And then the longitudinal ones, oh yeah, Try to make it three-dimensional, right? This is a tube, the inner layer is circular, the outer layer is longitudinal. They try to show you that here by which direction the fibers are going. We're looking at a cross section so we could tell those were all coming towards us, and then these are running the length. Sorry, that's some terrible artwork. Okay. Our fourth layer then is called the serosa. And the serosa is synonymous with visceral peritoneum, which we talked about previously, right, being part of those mesenteries, being part of uh, being a serous membrane that's exuding that serous fluid that is going to fill um, the peritoneal cavity, right? So you see the blood vessels um, in there and all that. All right, so we are gonna head on and start talking about the physiology.